Welcome to our third episode of Restoration Roundtable. Our last two conversations have been about two steam locomotive projects, one restarted restoration on Pennsylvania Railroad number 1361, and the other is a brand new build, a reincarnation of the Pennsylvania T1 class. So we decided to change things up and have a conversation with our friends Paul Middleton and Nick Simpson at the North Yorkshire Morris Railway in Pickering, England. The reason we're having them on today is because they are endeavoring on a major oil firing conversion project, the first full-size steam locomotive oil conversion in the UK since the end of steam. And they believe it is a crucial step forward in future-proofing one of the busiest heritage railways in the country and probably one of the most progressive railway heritage organizations in the world. So gentlemen, welcome to the conversation here today. Can you tell us a little bit about your railway? Because I think American audiences may not be as up to date, up to speed. Yeah, no, thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, I mean, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway celebrated its 50th year in 2023. So we've actually been in the railway preservation game now quite, quite a long time. Uh, myself, uh, Paul Middleton, Director of Mechanical Engineering, I've been with the organization 28 years. Yeah. And, and Nick, you've been with us a while now, haven't you? Uh, started at 11, 29 years, something like that. Worked since I was straight out of school, did an apprenticeship here, so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you're right. We are, we are one of the biggest preserved railways in the UK. We predominantly run steam engines um, through a, a variety of scenery from uh, a coastal town called Whitby um, to a, 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 a sort of a town out in the countryside called Pickering. Um, we're quite a, a heavily graded line. Um, we also run part of the railway runs on the national network as well, which, which adds challenges from an operational point of view. It means we, our engines have to conform to, to national standards for running on the network. Um, we have about 10 steam engines that we run at the moment that we're running on our railway, about 38 carriages, Mark 1 carriages, and we pull about sort of 300,000 people a year. So we, we're, a, we're a big setup in the UK. Yeah, we run six or seven diesels and up. On top of that, so it can be anything from well, your Belgian tram up to a 1950s 9F, yeah, right through to the more modern traction. Yeah, we had uh, Sir Nigel Gresley in A4, the streamlined loco, um, the world's fastest steam engine design. Just throw that in there. <laughs> <laughs> we're just about to welcome Royal Scott for the school holidays in a, in a two weeks' time, oh. so it, it never stops. Yeah, we're either running or we're mending or we're back running. And there's, yeah. there's around 110 employees on the MYMR, so we're, we're quite a big local employer, and we bring millions to the local economy, you know. Um, and, and it's, you know, we, we enjoy it, you know, it's a challenging job now, more so, hence why we're in the, this virtual room having this conversation, that it is becoming more challenging um, through the, the fuel supplies and, and other aspects. Um, but we, we, we're doing well. We're a busy railway. We've done a lot of um, film contracts as well. Um, we, we did Mission Impossible not so long ago and, and Indiana Jones. So we, we get them kind of work as well. So, yeah, um, it's uh, it's a big setup, but we enjoy it. And we get a real kick out of the challenges, don't we? We like to be first in fields. And... Yeah, yeah, and that's what this is about. This For us, this is an exciting opportunity to work with you guys ac across the pond and actually do something new, something different, and, and something that ultimately, which we'll come to, will have a significant impact on our business. Yeah. I read across an article about um, the line having to stop running steam locomotives in late 2022 due to spark emissions from the steam locomotives. Uh, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway runs through the uh, one of the largest national parks in the UK, the, the Moorlands, um, and there is a an issue with coal burning steam locomotives emitting hot embers, and so they had lit the uh, the moorlands on fire. As a matter of fact, they lit a, a swamp on fire, which I, is pretty hard to do. <laughs> and um, due to the fire risk, they had to stop running their steam locomotives. And then, as they explained recently, they have a number of steam locomotives in service that's core to their brand. And uh, I took it upon myself to play guess the email address roulette and shot a random email over to uh, Piglet and his uh, boss at the time, Chris Price, and said, hey, we're, we're FOW, we do uh, oil to, or excuse me, coal to oil conversions here in the United States, we'd like to hop on a call. So it was about November of 2022, Wolf, Shane, and I got on a call with, with uh, Piglet and Chris, and we talked about oil conversions, the work we had done with the Everett Railroad, some of the optimization uh, work we had done with the 148 down at U.S. Sugar. And we invited them to come over and, and see this stuff in action with us. And so February of 23, Chris and Piglet came over as part of our uh, Bring the, the Brits to America exchange program. 
<laughs> and they spent a week with us at the Sugar Express. Uh, U.S. Sugar was gracious enough to host them and allow them to, to work with us on the train crews there. And we threw them in the deep end. You know, we oversaw a peg lip, but let him fire the steam locomotive as much as he wanted to. Um, same thing with Chris. He was in the cab working with us. And really, they got to see how a more optimized, modern oil burning system works on the main line. Um, as Piglet mentioned, they have a very steep railroad. The ruling grade is just over 2%, which for the UK is very steep. It's a, a 1 in 49, as they would say in the UK. And so though it, the U.S. sugar territory is flat, we were able to pull about a 600 or 700 ton train, in that case up a 0.6 or 0.7. So it, it proved, uh, I guess the proof was in the pudding for Piglet and Chris to see the oil firing in action, maintaining pressure, no smoke. Um, a lot of those things, in particular, the no smoke and the efficient combustion, comes from a, a proper design and optimization of the system. But um, really, it was just giving Peglet and Chris an opportunity to, to see that in action. Whenever the topic of fuel conversion comes up on the internet, there's always a lot of emotions wrapped up into it. And I think everybody on this call and a part of this conversation loves burning coal, uh, loves the smell, loves the experience, loves the science, loves the technology behind it. But I think what gets lost in a lot of the conversations about fuel conversions is that there is an incredible amount of research and history in oil firing steam locomotives that goes back well into the industry, to the era when steam locomotives were running every day all the time. Davidson, you've done a lot of research along these lines, especially as it pertains to the Santa Fe Railway. Can you share some of the historical teachings of oil firing versus coal firing that we're learning from even now today. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I was invited to come speak at the Heritage Railway Association Conference in the UK in November. And being Americans, we all assumed that we were the first to do everything. And so I started doing some research to figure out, you know, well, yeah, the Santa Fe and the Southern Pacific, they were the first to burn oil. Well, that's not really true. Um, there was a, a British mechanical engineer that went to um, Russia in the 1860s and 1870s, it started converting locomotives there in the Caucasus Mountains to burn a very thick oil. There's oil supplies in the Caucasus Mountains. The guy's name was Thomas Urquhart. So he worked for 10 years, and he converted 150 locomotives to burn oil and had a lot of successes in the those conversions. It was a different style burner and system than we're used to today, but that was really the pioneer. He came back to England. He was a member of the uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers in England. Um, presented his findings, and then the Great Eastern Railway in England started converting their locomotives to burn a combination of coal and something called, it was like a coal residue. So at the time, the, ga the, the lighting on the streets in England were gas lamps made by coal, that was gasified. And I guess in Victorian England, they were just dumping the, this oily residue into the creeks. And someone said, hey, let's not dump that in the creek, let's burn that stuff. And so... Uh, James Holden was that engineer's name. He started converting uh, express passenger locomotives and switching locomotives to burn this mix of coal distillate and uh, coal itself. But it was kind of like the steam locomotive itself. Uh, they may have the fastest in the UK, but we certainly had a, a, a pedicle of technology. The Brits invented it, and we perfected the system, right? So it was in the 1890s, um, an oil company, the Union Oil Company in California, approached the Southern Pacific Railway and said, we would like to borrow a locomotive and try to convert it to burn oil. Southern Pacific said, we're not interested. So the company pivoted to the Santa Fe. And Santa Fe said, sure, you can have this little 440. And they loaned the locomotive to the Union Oil Company, and they spent about a year trying to figure out different oil burning systems, different burners, exhausts, all that stuff, and um, developed a pretty nice system. And so within about 10 years, like 1892, 1893, within about 10 years, the Santa Fe had hundreds of oil burning locomotives, and the um, Southern Pacific quickly followed suit. And what we saw in the U.S. was a conversion of locomotives for Class 1 railroads that serviced oil fields, right? All of these decisions on the railroads uh, pivot around economics. If it's cheaper for them to burn oil, they would burn oil. If it's cheaper for them to burn coal, they would burn coal. Um, and what we're seeing now with our discussions with the NYMR is a similar discussion, right? Is it, is it actually cheaper to burn oil? Um, certain times a year it might be, depending upon the fluctuation of fuel prices. But if the alternative is you can burn oil and run steam, or you can't run steam because of fire risk, 
if there's a little bit higher price to burn oil, it still makes some businesses to do and the alternative of not running any steam locomotives. I would add to the economics of that too, is uh, one of the considerations is the labor, uh, higher labor associated with, with all the cleaning steps required for coal uh, versus oil. So that, that contributes to the economic discussion as well. There was a really interesting study I ran across uh, that the Santa Fe Railway did in the 1940s. And they were trying to determine um, the economics of converting locomotives from coal to oil and vice versa, right? They, had to, they did a lot of research to figure out the efficiency of the combustion. And what the study showed is that um, converting from a hand-fired steam locomotive to oil saved 25% of fuel on a BTU to BTU basis. And then converting a Stoker-fired engine from coal to oil saved 40%. So, you know, so even on, on the get-go, if you're going to look at a, a greenhouse gas emissions side of the equation, which is of great importance in the UK uh, in particular right now, on a straight BTU to BTU basis, going from a hand-fired locomotive to, to oil will save you, on average, 25% on just general greenhouse gas emissions. Paul and Nick, that line-side fire was an obvious catalyst, but what were some of the other considerations that were in play uh, prior to that event when it came to uh, fuel prices and, and coal firing? Yeah, I mean, coal in the UK is is uh, becoming harder to source. In fact, uh, the last UK coal mine shut um, just, just last year in the UK, so that's the end of it. There is no more UK coal. So everything is having to be imported. Um, and, and, and the challenges of wh where we are um, out in the countryside means that our haulage costs are high of, of getting it into the UK, and our, and our, our coal costs in, in 12 months have almost tripled. Um, so it's, it is becoming becoming a financial challenge as well as a, a logistical challenge of actually getting it. And one of the other things that happened in the UK um, about 12 months ago was the, the banning of normal household coal in, in, in England um, for domestic purposes. So a lot of the traditional coal men that used to go around dropping coal off at houses can now can only sell um, smokeless ovoids and, and manufactured fuels. And they, they are, they are, they're, they're okay in a domestic appliance. And we have actually tried these in our, our steam engines. And with varying success, um, one of the problems we find with them is that they've got a high anthracite content, which, which results in quite a slow burn. Um, and also they're quite high in ash as well. You haven't got the volatile gases there. So it's very different from, from, from running our normal sort of mid-volatile fuels. And, and the, the crew struggled with them a little bit, and we did have clinker as well. So And, and they were awfully messy. It was like sand, wasn't it, yeah, it in was, the ash yeah. pan? So we sort of tried it, and it, it almost works. In, in applications where the engines probably aren't working as hard on a smaller railway, if you're only a couple of miles long, it might be all right. But on a, on a railway where our engines um, up the hills are working absolutely flat out, there's, there's nothing left. You know, your regulator's wide open. You know, you, you're well down the rack on the gear. You, you, you know, you're working hard and, and the fires just don't respond well when you raise that temperature with the ovoid. So this is why we're, we're seriously looking at oil, because it's, 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 it's now making sense from a commercial and practical point of view. We're also pretty good at reflection. We, you, you take a look at what workload you've got on. And when Paul's visiting numerous coal merchants and then developing a blend of, of smokeless ovoid that we might be able to try and then working on R&D development on Spark Arrest and Meshes, Meshes sorry. It, it's where do you focus your time? And there's that much time has gone into this that we almost need to draw a line at it now because I don't think there'll be any more development on lumped fuel anymore. Yeah. You yeah. think of world shipping, it, you know, someone's going to have to develop a fuel that can carry on bringing products all over the world, shipping mm. uh, wagons, articulated lorries all over the world. And, mm. and none of that runs on, on lumped fuel call anymore no no and and with our you know with the our passengers you know of a, a, almost a different generation coming through that that, that you know coal is seen as the bad guy you know and, yeah. and the reality is it is a fil filthy dirty horrible fossil fuel we can't change that um but when people come and you know see see our engines full of that you know that that's not always going to be acceptable moving forward i think i think perception's changing and I think we've got to react to that. And if we want to keep these engines running, which we do um, for, for a long time, we need to be sort of evolving and developing and making sure that we can keep up with the, you know, the, the current trends and, and making sure that we're relevant in, in the years to come. Most people who see a, a steam engine 
chuffing around it, it it's the magic of the steam engine and it comes into the station and i don't think many would know the difference between something full of coal and something full of yeah a, a fuel oil that was very clear when i was out in florida it was actually really and it was that that's the only you saw that out there you had to be there and experience it talking to the passengers and that was exactly it they weren't bothered about the fuel source no. it was the fact that it was still a big impressive steam engine with all of the the steam coming out and all the atmospherics and, the, and and all that and it didn't actually make any difference and that that made me come back with even more confidence that we can make this work over here I think, again i think there's a piece to be done for understanding how coal evolve the world and and the position now the world's in because of coal and the power that that produced uh, but i think we could do both i think there's an educational piece there and we can be forward looking and preserve these wonderful machines well and one of the beauties of oil firing is especially the type of burner that we're going to uh, provide for for you folks is you have an opportunity to burn a range of fuels so you could burn used motor oil, you could burn diesel fuel, you can burn biodiesel, you can burn recycled chip oil, you know, <laughs> there's there's all kinds of options there to allow, allow you to keep going into the future. I was just going to say, it's funny you should say that, one of the largest chip producers in, in Britain is just down the road. <laughs> yeah, we're going to go give them a visit. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Can you talk a little bit about the um, the, the relationship of of oil firing compared to coal firing, the changes in thermodynamics and how a locomotive can be successfully engineered to burn fuel oil, because it's not just modifications to the the fuel source itself. It's the firebox. It might be the smoke box. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those sure. changes? Um, people need to understand that the, the steam locomotive is, is a, a holistic system in and of itself, you know, ever, ever since they figured out the relationship uh, between draft and combustion, that that interlinkage has been, um, you know, one of the, the defining characteristics of the, the Stevensonian, right, steam locomotive, um, invented there in the UK, of course. Um, and so with that, with, with a coal bed, you know, uh, Paul or, or Nick was talking about the um, the, the anthracite fuel and and the the time delay associated with that. Um, well, when you've, when you've designed a locomotive around coal combustion, the, the, the grates, the drafting system, uh, all that uh, factors in that, that kind of time delay aspect of coal firing. Um, but the, the coal bed that's spread out across the, the grates there um, factors into um, the heat transfer aspects and, and also steam, steam making ability, of course. And so when you change to oil, you have a, a much uh, faster reacting system. You know, if you need to, to uh, if you're throttling up to, to, to attack a grade, you know, you flick the firing valve open, just the atomizer, and you've got a bigger fire like right now. Um, and so that, that changes the way you, you, you fire the locomotive. Um, and from, from the technical side, um, you have uh, when you when you throttle down, you have to get that fire smaller. Um, you, you know, there's there's dynamics associated with that. Now to, to compensate, right? Because with with a traditional locomotive boiler, you really don't want fast uh, changes in heat flux. Meaning you don't want to go from a big fire to a small fire or a small fire to a big fire um, necessarily instantaneously, uh, because there are um, maintenance effects, right? The, the, the thermal expansion and contraction in the, in the firebox uh, is going to change a little bit. You don't want that to happen too fast because you start breaking stables. And so we do things like adding a fire brick. So we add thermal mass uh, to, the, to the box that sort of simulates the thermal mass of a, of a, of a great system with the coal spread out across the entire box. And that helps give you that thermal stability that will protect the, the boiler itself from breakage issues and things like that. Now, also with coal combustion, um, you know, one of the big challenges and, and one of the big things that the Davidson mentioned earlier in terms of CO2 production, right? With coal, a lot of the coal ends up getting not burned and just getting sucked off the grates and goes up the stack. That's a lot of the black smoke you see with a coal burner. Um, so to, to limit that carryover of fuel, um, uh, the, the drafting system on a coal-fired steam locomotive doesn't pull quite as strongly as what you need to effectively uh, 
uh, do this do similar on oil. With oil, it's all about um, you know air fuel mixing um, and how you're how you're doing that. Uh, and and to support that, you really need a little bit of a stronger draft uh, to manage that. So you can see we're, we're making changes in the firebox, we're making changes in the in the smoke box and the drafting system. Um, and of course, you've got the associated plumbing that goes with the, the combustion system, you know, oil control, atomizer control, blower control, because you have to, in some cases, respond a little bit faster on the blower than you would necessarily on a coal burner. Um, all these things factor into the design of the system and the, and the changes you have to make in, in totality to the locomotive. Nick and Paul, can you tell us about what locomotive has been selected for the conversion and, and why that locomotive in particular? So we've got a, a 210 <coughs> Dave Vera Lynn um, austerity. Yeah, it's a wartime austerity wartime engine. Austerity. It's quite a big engine in the UK. For you guys, it's probably sort of medium sized, but for us, it's, it's a fair fair lump of engine. About £35,000 tractive effort. Yeah, but um, we, we remember it running as kids around the railway mm. um, and on its last 10 year boiler overall, got parked in the backfield. Mm. Um, and it's one of the last ones we haven't tackled. Yeah. Yeah, it's a job we want to get finished, isn't it? Yeah. And, and this locomotive lends itself really well to a to a, to to an oil conversion because actually these locos were some of them were built as oil burners, so therefore we're making actually something still historically correct. Um, it, it lends itself, you know, wide firebox, steel firebox. Um, it, it lends itself relatively easy for a conversion in the UK. Um, and, and when we've got the drawings, I actually managed to get the drawings from Greece yeah. for the tender tank and um, for the oil tank. So we, we've already got a good start. And I think this is a real opportunity bringing a, a very popular engine over here in Yorkshire. You know, it, it holds a lot of fond memories for people to actually bring that back as a, a groundbreaking engine that's actually going to show, you know, what, what can be done, I think is really exciting. We've got long term view, views on it. Um... The big engine, the 210 on the front of the diner, which is our premier product, not covering everybody in black belching smoke and soot emissions is is, <laughs> is win-win. That's, mm -hmm. that's our premier product, silver service with a, a clean steam engine on the front. That's mm -hmm. what we're aiming for. Yeah. Can you guys talk a little bit about your internal conversations uh, and maybe some of the commentary you've seen out in the wild uh, has this been an easy cultural shift or did, does everyone there just sort of understand the, the points as you've laid them out? Like this is the future. This is, this is the way of things. Um, when Davison visited us, he spent four, five days on shed and give an excellent presentation to our quite rugged, hardcore ingrained staff <laughs> who instantly got it. There wasn't much resistance. I mean, he might be a great salesman, but I mean, <laughs> the, the thing, <laughs> The thing that Paul witnessed when he drove the engine, yeah, uh, they instantly got. They asked really technical questions. They they understood the the, the added mass in the the firebox to retain the heat. They understood how to uh, really cut fine control, and you're not relying so heavily on the firemen shoveling and their knowledge of the line. You can instantly modify how your engine's performing. And I think on that basis, I was quite impressed on how well they took it. I thought there was going to be a few. Mm strange questions that Davison had to deflect, but they got it. Yeah, I, I actually think probably if there is going to be a challenge, it's probably more with our footplate crews, because obviously part of shoveling coal and it's like, you know, the, 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 the shovel is like their sort of prize tennis racket or whatever, or golf clubs. It's Sorry, like, so. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's probably where we'll have a little bit more uh, of a challenge. But I think the reality is people are starting to realise uh, that Piglet's getting bolder by the day because of the stress he has finding... <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking about this between the folks, the NYMR and, and our team. And there's a couple of things to consider. Um, the coal burning locomotive, you have to get there early in the morning. You have to light your fire. You have to, I mean, in their case, your, your people come on shed. If they're running every day, they come on shed at what, five in the morning? So there's a bit of background. Our shed is 365 days a year. And when we're running, it's 5 a.m., like Davidson said, right through to half past nine, 10 o'clock at night. So one of the benefits that the oil provides is you can just turn the fire off and go home, and then you can come back in the morning and turn the fire back on. If you have proper insulation, you have a tight throttle, you can have a decent amount of pressure left on the boiler, right? At U.S. Sugar, granted it's in Florida where it's warm, but when we put the 140 away, 148 away at night, we'll have 180 pounds in the boiler. You come back in the morning, there's 
120, 110, you light it back up and you're ready to go in an hour and a half, basically. And so we believe there'll be a circumstance there in the UK, even with the locomotives in the shed or outside, where you can cut an hour or two off that fire up period in the morning when you get the, the locomotive started and, and underway. Um, the United States has something called the self-cleaning smoke box, which means all the cinders just get blasted out. <laughs> and then in the UK, they have uh, they have to shovel their smoke boxes out, right? So there's a labor associated with opening that smoke box door, shoveling out the cinders, all that stuff. That goes away with an oil burner. Um, there's also just the general savings associated with the efficiency of combustion. Um, Piglet was able to get fuel prices for me from their local fuel supplier. I looked at sort of global prices and trends. You know, it makes sense that in the summertime, your home heating oil demand is low, which means that the price for home heating oil is also uh, lower than it would be in the wintertime. Our basic analysis shows that in summertime, it should be cheaper to run a steam locomotive on the NYMR with oil, but in the wintertime, it's more expensive, right? So is there a world where it makes sense to get some storage tanks and store your own fuel when the price is cheap to try to hedge your future fuel costs? Um, Piglet, how many tons of coal per year does the NYMR consume? We we burn just over two thousand tons a year, so it's it's a, it's a fair bit of fuel that we burn. It varies a little bit, um, but yeah, it's, it hovers around that figure. When we're busy, it's eighty tons a week we order it. Sure, and all that's delivered by a small truck down a narrow road. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, our, our access is is uh, very out in the Yorkshire countryside. There's there's no real main roads to it, so we can go and get it in twenty ton loads on the old deviation line railway that was the original yeah. rail, horse drawn railway up to Gotham. It was, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a historical site we're on, really. But yeah. it's now our ash track with for wagons coming down. Yeah, so it is. It's challenging. <laughs> um, if, if I could if I could get in our tips, I'd save more money. But hundred hundred truck loads a year. Well, there's there's other considerations too, right? When you think about uh, fire cleaning and, and impacts on your your schedule, um, disposal of ash, right? Those are those are other considerations that are going to get like the, the ash disposal consideration is going to get probably much more difficult as time goes on. Um, so that's another another cost factor that, that people don't always think about. We are finding over the years that there are less and less volunteers to, to help run the railway. I mean, it is something we're actively trying to, to change, but the further you come away from those that remember steam, the less people are, are actively wanting to be involved. And if you, if you have an oil burner, you could probably save two hours of your crew's day by not having to come in so early to prep it and not have to um, um, dispose of it at the end of the day. And that's that, that's quite a significant saving. When we've got sort of, you know, three or four engines out every day, that's yeah. a lot of man hours saved. And, and, and it's just benefits all around. They're not getting as filthy, you know, they're, they're going to have a, you know, a go home and, and not get in trouble with a wife and stuff for, for coming on filthy and bringing dirt back with them. And I, and I think that's really important. We've got to look at that because, you know, these are important future challenges we've got. Yeah, I think the, the, the pool of nutters <laughs> is getting smaller on, on who wants to run these things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're rare breeds now. Yeah, we are, yeah. <laughs> oil, oil conversion, the source of all domestic tranquility. That's right. Part of the thing that you mentioned in the preamble, Kelly, is that we all started, by and large, all started burning coal, right? And we, we understand the importance and the heritage of coal, and we hear a lot, oh, we want to make sure we preserve the art of hand firing and, and all that sort of stuff. And there's no there's no reality or, or future necessarily where the NYMR gets rid of all historical coal burning locomotives. But it's a matter of, um, this is a term that, that Piglet uses a lot, it's a matter of future-proofing the railroad, the railway. Um, they kept calling it the North Yorkshire Moors Railroad, and I was set straight very quickly, it's the railway. Um, and that, that's something that's, that's important, right? The, the business <clears throat> of their charity is providing an experience in the steam era, right? And like Piglet said, if there's, it doesn't matter to the general public, typically what fuel goes in the firebox is still chugs, it still has the whistle and all the atmosphere of steam. Being as busy as you gentlemen are and, and the rest of the railway, what are some other projects that you would 
categorize under future proofing? Uh, how else is the rubber looking into the future? I, I think one thing that, that there's been a big step forward, we're, we're actually sat in a, a, a 1930s um, gentleman's saloon carriage here inside a carriage shed. So we've, we've just um, 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 invested heavily um, thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Fund yeah. I think I got that the right way around, um, in, a, in a massive carriage care facility to try and keep these historical assets under the cover and keep the worst of the, uh, the, the Yorkshire weather off them. Um, I think I think we need to do more of that with the steam engines as well as actually protecting them when they're out of service because the nature of the way the railway has evolved, it's all a bit sporadic. And if you'd start again, you wouldn't build it like it's built now. Uh, I mean, you'd have the steam engine depot down this end of the line. Yeah. It's actually 18 miles away in a little village down the bottom of a valley, which just makes access and everything difficult. So they're the kind of things we're looking at is, is actually how can we make the railway more efficient to operate the pl things are in the right place um we have done some developments of putting tension with toilet tanks on our coaches um so that we're not putting the waste directly onto the track that was completed a couple of years ago and we're next looking at the options for putting air conditioning in some of our coaches we're looking at electric train heating for the winter so these are the sort of things we're kind of thinking about but we've got to try and keep the atmosphere of of what we are yeah. Um, but we, we we do want to look at modern technologies, and I, and I think the biggest challenge is funding all of this. That's always going to be the challenge. Is is actually where does the money come from? Like we can come up with all the ideas we want, but it, unless we've got the funding, um, we're not going to get it. And we're we're lucky on this railway that we've got a, a really professional team that that look at the fundraising side and, and getting the money for us because um, we're really good at spending it. Aren't yeah, we? yeah. I think from my side, the the future proofing has to come from the people. I've worked incredibly hard to get apprentices through the shed so they can learn proper heritage skills. We try and take a couple on, you know, every couple of years. We try to have a rolling programme so we can invest in them people. And they go to a local college where they're learning modern engineering and then they can come and put it onto our heritage machines, which is really important. We've, we've, we've just invested in CNC equipment so we can start machining our own components quicker. And then we've also got... Uh, we need to inspire the next load of volunteers, so the junior volunteer program's really good mm. and we get we, we try and light a flame in the, the the kids early on to get this bug to mm. replace us one day because yeah you know, like big says we're getting older and balder and more knackered <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about the the science and the tech a little bit can you talk to me about the tactile experience of firing 148 and how coming from your background and perspective and experience what that was like and how quickly you were able to adapt as an engine man, as a fireman on an oil firing locomotive it, it was it was a great experience and something very different i've, I've, I've obviously done a, a reasonable amount of coal firing and to, to walk up to 148 and and see how clean the engine was from a from an engineering perspective the first impression was wow this is clean there's no ash covering everywhere in all of the bearings we're not having to start the day by going under and raking out an ash pan and and being filthy before we start so that was the first thing you know a, a, a well-kept machine is going to last longer it's going to cost you less money ultimately so that was an immediate benefit um, and, and obvious as i got there um, and it it, it was really intuitive, actually. Once I got in the seat and, and had a go at actually firing it, I actually, it was quite easy to pick up, but it's very much a thinking man's game. And it's very much, you work much closer with the driver, or the engineer, as you guys call it. Um, you work very much more as a team because you've got to react a lot quicker and you've got to communicate because everything, as you said, is instant. You need to know when he's adjusting the reverser or closing or opening the throttle. But what I did find was that the engine literally, I could sit there within five pounds of blowing off all day. There was none of this up and down. There was, there was you know, the firebox temperature fluctuations in, in terms of, you know, that side of it was actually really stable. And, and I think, you know, whereas coal, when you stop for dinner for an hour and you can see the pressure drops off and then you're having to put more coal on and, you know, your fire temperature is going up and down. When you stop for an hour, you can actually just gently bring it down and then leave it ticking over almost. Um, so that was really good. And then, and then once we actually got going, your loads, yes, it was flat, 
were compar comparable to how our engines work. You know, you had about, I think, 450 tonnes. We pull about 300. But the, the actual, the train loadings were, were, were very similar. So it was, it was a good feel of, of, of how to get the fire going and get it up to temperature, um, keeping the water, um, you know, the regular shots of water into the boiler and, 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 and going. And it, it was good. And I, I think... A lot of our crews actually, once they've had a go of it, would really enjoy it because yeah. you're still firing a steam locomotive, but it's just not as physical. Yeah. But you very much, it's a thinking man's thing. And, and I think for, for those that, you know, we may lose because they want to shovel coal, you'll actually gain people because they can actually do it because it's not as physical. Yeah. And when you're not paying people, I think that's quite important. Wolf, can you talk a little bit about what the next steps are in this conversion project? We are in the process of getting drawings, dimensions, um, pictures of the equipment to convert. And then we will start um, basically sizing a burner. We've got a, a calculation methodology that we go through to, to size the burner to make sure it can put out the BTUs needed to support the steaming rate that's possible with that locomotive. Uh, you know, the, the firebox size, the tube configuration it impacts the steaming rate. Um, and so... We'll, we'll size up the burner. We'll do some sizing work on the drafting system. Um, so that that those calculations will translate into equipment changes and to, you know, how manufacturing dimensions for a burner. And then we will start trickling that information over to, the, to, to Paul and Nick, and they can start doing things like building the tanks out and, um, you know, starting to route plumbing and things like that. We'll provide them with a, a piping diagram so they know how to, you know, where the lines roughly need to go, and they can work that out in detail. So it'll be it'll be a collaborative process um, to to make sure we're, um, you know, respecting the historical profile of the locomotive as we're doing this conversion, but making sure it's going to be an effective and clean burning conversion. Uh, with you know making sure the air openings are, are are right and all that stuff, and then once that's that's set, uh, we'll make sure that they have um, you know a manual for how to operate the equipment and uh, training as well. Um, so make sure that as as they start to introduce this into service, that um, their crews know how to operate it, and we can you know every every locomotive is unique, so there there are little quirks that um, you know as we're as we're uh, bringing this locomotive up in operation under oil burning conditions that we're understanding what those quirks are. And fortunately, um, pretty much everybody on our team has both coal and oil experience on a, a multitude of sizes of locomotives. And that gives us a good, good background of experience to, to bring over there and say, okay, the locomotive is, is doing this in these conditions. We need to change and operate it this way. And so we can we can apply that experience to that particular locomotive, and um, and really help everybody come up to speed quickly with the new system. One thing that was really beneficial, um, as Nick mentioned, I spent about a week with them on their line in November after this conference. I had a chance to to ride on the footplate with one of their crews, and one of the funny things the engineer said when he grabbed the the shovel from the other fireman, he goes, "Every locomotive, every engine driver over here is just a permanently frustrated fireman." <laughs> but um you know we had it was the diner train that we were on um and it was a, a black five which is one of the standard british um mixed use locomotives and like Biglet said they got to the bottom of the hill it was full throttle for like six miles because that was it that's all the engine would do just chug 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 up the hill the iron was keeping up and if we got more pressure we go faster if the pressure dropped we go slower you know and that's one that he went there <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it was pretty amazing to see there are a huge number of tourist railroads in the United States where the engine gets to the base of the hill and just, that's it, <laughs> up you go. Um, but <laughs> what'll be beneficial with the the conversion to oil is that some of these locomotives may actually have an increase in steaming availability, I mean, for pulling trains. There's no doubt they'll have more steaming ability, but um, for instance, the Everett Railroad number 11, which we converted from coal to oil working with the, the folks there at the Everett Railroad, they could pull one more coach up the hill because uh, they have that much more additional steaming power uh, due to the conversion to um, oil. So there are going to be additional benefits from this, but as we as we do the conversion from for Dame Vera Lynn, um, like Wolf said, we will do the engineering. We will build some of the core components in the U.S., the burner, the exhaust system, and some of the controls. But really, it's going to be the NYMR 
workshop staff that do the fitting out of this to our drawings, right? With any of these projects, the key is starting with the foundation of good engineering and clear, clear drawings, and then a close collaboration across the pond. So uh, it'll be really as much a British project as it is an American project to get this locomotive converted. Nick, is this conversion project something you are actively fundraising for, or is it already funded as a part of your budget? It's an ongoing funding. We've the group that are funding for Vera Lynn's overhaul are doing such a fantastic job. We're having to spend the money, so we've actually overhauled the tender fully. We're now looking at taking the boiler off the frames, and then we can bring the frames in for uh, their rebuild, which will be a uh, tire turning and a new axle that's needed. And then as, as the money is being spent and people can see the work that's going on, the, they are donating more and more. Mm. Uh, so it's an ongoing all the time. Why Vera lends to it so well is because we've started with the tender. People can see a brand new tender. All, we've just finished painting it. Mm -hmm. Brand new in green. And you can see where the tank's going to drop in. Um, so it's really exciting from that point of view. The fundraising then builds and builds and builds. And hopefully there'll be enough to finish the boiler. Mm. But that's what the that's the key, and the key is that we, we we need the money to do it. It's like all heritage railways; it's all linked to how fast and how much you can get in. It's. Um, mm. it's I, I think people are willing to get on board and support an exciting new project like this as well. I think that's something that they're they're interested in. They want to see what happens. They're seeing progress already, and I think that's going to really help. You know, with hopefully um giving them some of their hard-earned cash to help support us and, and keep the railway running. And it's also, there's a real buzz around the shed on the volunteers that are coming that they can't wait to start on Vera. You know, we, we, we're planning on taking the boiler off in the next couple of months, and as soon as we get them frames in, our volunteer gangs will be they'll be at it. They'll be hmm. descaling needle gun, they'll be paint flying off it as, you, as fast as we can get compressed air to them, to their air tools. It's, I suppose what's, uh, what's really good to see is that we're getting other owners approaching us asking us how this project with Vera is progressing and mm. if we th if they think if we think their engine's suitable for conversion and how we would go about it and things it, it, it's almost lit a flame under the industry i think in this country i think it, it's caused excitement it's caused a bit of interest and and I, and I generally think every time i've talked about it it's always been a positive response yeah. i've not met many people that have gone oh it's a rubbish idea and you're taking it away from what what it's about, you know, firing by coal. And I actually think it's nice that people are realising, and it's important that they do, that actually this is how we're going to, this is, you know, an option where we're going to uh, take up on and, and, and use effectively on the MYMR. And like Davidson said, this isn't necessarily the end of coal firing. This is a supplement to it that we can use our engines strategically. The oil burners go out when we've got the summer heat waves. And then we can still keep a bit of the traditional coal engines burning, say, in the winter. So there'll always be a mix. I don't think it's the end of coal, but I do think this is a, a, an important strategy, you know, for the railway moving forward. I think we're at a point where it's it's almost as important as the, the first that saved the railway and rebuilt it from nothing. We're at a point now where we need to carry on and mm -hmm. ensure this oil burning is part of the future. I'm certain of it. One of the benefits of riding along on the footplate was seeing how their firemen and their, their cabs are set up, which is a little bit different than the U.S., right? So Wolf talked about having a blower control right at hand. Well, on the, the Black 5 I was on, the blower is a knob right in the middle of the black head, in the back head, excuse me. So, I mean, it's when, it, when we looked at the, the, the cab of Dave Vera Lynn, you know, one thing that uh, Nick and Piglet and I were talking about is the arrangement of the controls, trying to figure out how the injectors go on and go off. Typically, oil firing in the U.S., you're seated in the seat, whereas these hand-fired locomotives in the U.K. were designed for standing up almost entirely. They have a little uh, jump seat you can perch on, but uh, steam controls for the injector, that sort of thing, are typically on the top of the back head. So um, there's sort of a systems design approach that we're going through, but it was great to have a chance to ride on the footplate and see how they, they do what they do with these standard locomotives and, and figure out the, the right way forward. Ultimately, we're, we're absolutely thrilled to be able to work with the North Yorkshire Moors Railway on this project. I, I think they've been a visionary in the UK in railway preservation for more than 50 years now. And as Nick mentioned, I mean, this is something that's going to be important for the, the future of the preservation over there. Um, for us personally, I mean, this is a very unique project. Uh, earlier, Wolf mentioned the Stevensonian locomotive. George Stevenson was the engineer that laid out that railway. <laughs> so 
it's sort of full circle for us uh, in our, our place of passion with the steam locomotives. So trying to do what we can to future-proof preservation uh, in the UK as well as here in the US is something that we're exceptionally proud of. Uh, and it's been just a great experience thus far. So looking forward to the future on this. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the challenges of running steam engines are all the same, aren't they? You know, with what you guys have, have done over there and what we try and achieve here, that ultimately we all have a common goal. And I think using our expertise in our field and sharing that information is really important moving forward because everybody loves a steam engine, don't they? You know, there's no question of that. Um, but not everyone realises the challenges of actually making that happen. The efforts that go in to getting that black five on the front of that diner train is, is phenomenal. You know, and, it, and, and, and Nick's right. about It's all about the people. We need the people with the drive and the skill set to make that happen. That's, that's the most fundamentally important thing. Without them, it ain't going to happen. And I think moving forward, that's why things like this are going to make it more relevant. They're going to they're going to help it continue. And and at the end of the day, it's a better working environment, isn't it? So I, I don't. It's, just, it's a win win for me. Are you guys planning to uh, produce any video content for your YouTube channel on this project as it moves along? Is that something that's in the pipeline? Yeah, I mean, we we do do um, the cult piglet chats that we put on our our, our, our NYMI YouTube channel, and I, I'm always under pressure from marketing to actually go out and and do some. Um, but but trying to get that done amongst all my other day jobs and delving in a bit of telly now and again is proving quite challenging. But but yes, I need to pull my finger out and actually dedicate a bit of time to this um, to get it out there on the socials, as it's called, um, and and actually sort of get people aware of what we're doing and get them excited. But you I just mean, made us look really old. <laughs> well, I, 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 this is this is the bane of every yeah. mechanical I don't know, I in the world. Got to use the tweeter, boy. Got to use the tweeter. It is, it is because all all I want to. All, all I want to do is go and fix engines and pull my sleeves up and get in there and, and, and you know, yep. get stuck into it. Um, but we can't forget, I guess, the importance of this. It is important, but it's not my default or Nick's position to sit there in front of a camera going, hey, look at us, look what we're doing and all of this kind of stuff. But actually, we just want to get our head down yeah. and get on with it. Yeah, that British reserve, it needs breaking sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Gentlemen, we are looking forward to seeing the fruits of our mutual labor in this oil conversion project. Uh, we're excited to work with you, as Davidson has said. Um, FMW Solutions will be posting updates periodically uh, about this project, both on our website, fmwsolutions.com, and our Facebook and YouTube channel. Anyone that's interested in your organization can go to nymr.co.uk, and you're also very active on YouTube. You have a fantastic following. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Cheers, fellas. <laughs>